Hello gardeners and thank you for watching Mid-American Gardener. We're here to talk about all things plants, insects, tools, whatever we have going on right now. That's what we're going to talk about. So thanks for joining us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department. So I will answer questions about cut flowers, maybe perennials, but there are three really good and intelligent looking folks sitting next to me. Let's find out who they are and their expertise areas. I'm going to go first to you, David Robson. Thanks, Diane. I'm David Robson. I also work in the Crop Sciences Department. I'm a pesticide specialist. Uh, I handle mainly ornamentals, turf grass, trees, uh, shrubs, things along those lines, and then some of the insect disease and weed problems. Today I wanted to talk a little bit about pruning and the fact that summer pruning may not always be the best thing, except if the branch is dead or dying. Uh, a lot of times people say, oh, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to start pruning my evergreen because it's too big. But a lot of times we still can get new growth and that new growth won't have a chance to mature before winter and a lot of times it dies off. You also have an, an open wound and that open wound can attract insects and then we have disease problems. When you prune, select the right type of tool. Uh, a lot of times the best ones are the small hand pruners. They come in all different sizes. There's some extremely large ones. There's some for real teeny tiny hands. Uh, we even have a left-handed one. So if you're a lefty southpaw and you kind of complain that every other tool is for righties, there are some left-handed ones. Make sure that they have a comfortable grip. Again, the smaller ones are usually used for material maybe up to three quarters of an inch in diameter. If you're going to go larger, you probably need to get a pair of loppers. Some of the newer loppers have fiberglass handles. They also have expandable handles, which allows you to reach higher. With any of your tools, make sure that you're done. When you're done with them, you clean them. If you're cutting out dead material, diseased material, make sure you sterilized after each cut so you don't transmit that disease onto the next plant. Very good. What a nice array. And we thought they were giveaways to the panel. Um, no. But Sorry. We thank heard you. Sounds like it, wishful thinking. It was wishful, wishful thinking. thinking. I thought it was a good <laughs> idea, Jim. Yes. <laughs> he could. You have a shirt, Diane. Okay. Well, there is that. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to go to the person in the middle, Chuck Voigt. Well, thanks, Diane. Uh, I, too, worked in the crop sciences department here at the University of Illinois. I recently retired. Uh, my specialties were vegetables and herbs, so questions along those lines would be especially appropriate. You know, I can spill over into fruits and, and some other things if need be. Uh, I'm going to start with a balcony gardening question. Okay. Barbara sent this in. Uh, Barbara lives in a 12-story condominium building and would like to use the balcony for gardening vegetables as well as bush raspberries. Her concern is about pollinators. She wants to attract bees, hummingbirds, butterflies. Uh, is it reasonable to hope that they'll find my garden on the 10th floor? The short answer is if, if you have it, and it they'll, they'll come. Um, as, as far as pollinators, uh, they seem to have a knack of, of, of detecting really small amounts of, of, of essence from, from, from flowers and, and can find them and do that. I have a little bit of a concern about bush raspberries in a container on a 10th floor balcony. Um, if you get the fall bearers, plant them in the spring, you might get one crop that first fall. I would be a little hesitant to think that they're going to overwinter in a pot on the balcony because it's going to freeze and thaw and have all kinds of problems. Uh, but if you, can, if you can get them to do that, then fine. People like to prove me wrong, and, and that, would be okay. <laughs> that would be okay too. Uh, but uh, a perennial, a perennial in, a, in a container, unless it's a really, really large one, um, might not make it through the winter. But w with fall bearing, you could plant them in the spring and harvest at least that first crop in the fall. That's true. Well, that was a good question. So <coughs> pollinators will find it, all of the plants. Okay, let's go to the person to my left, and this is Dr. Jim Appleby. So I'm an entomologist in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences. So I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. Um, Diane, you know, uh, one of my favorite trees is bald cypress. Oh, I agree. And uh, brought in some branches of bald cypress. They remind me of much of a uh, 
an evergreen, but actually it's a deciduous tree that drops its leaves in the fall months. It's susceptible to adult feeding of Japanese beetles. That's one drawback. The other insect that it does get is this uh, little gall insects. And I, it, you can see here some of the little white objects on the uh, leaves or twigs. This is caused by the cypress twig gall midge. It's a, a fly that looks a little bit like a mosquito, but a little bit larger than a mosquito. And uh, they lay their eggs on the leaves, and then when the eggs hatch, the larvae enter the tissue, and then the plant reacts by forming this tissue called a gall over top of them. Now, let me explain the life history of this insect. I brought some uh, old galls. This is what it looks like in the fall months once the needles drop. Uh, then you see these brown galls on the uh, branches. This insect overwinters in the larval stage. So uh, during the winter months, if you'd cut a gall like this open up and open it up, you would find orange larvae inside. So uh, they overwinter in the larval stage. Then they change into the pupa stage. And then in, the, in about the month of, uh, oh, generally in uh, late April, they emerge as adults from these galls on the ground. Now, one control measure you can use is simply rake up these galls in the fall or winter months and then burn them or put them in a uh, compost heap and then cover them with soil. That way, the insect will not emerge. They have several generations a year. We did uh, several research studies on this for, and we published several papers on it. So uh, we, found we used insecticides to try to control it, but nothing really controlled it very well. So I think the cultural method of simply collecting the galls in the winter months and taking care of that, that will reduce the populations considerably. So that would be my recommendation as a control. That's a very practical one. That's good. And to see them, how big they get, and some of them are quite big. Yes, some of them are. And you know, there's another point in that I didn't mention that some trees are resistant. So you'll okay. have some bald cypress trees that are heavily galled and then right aside of them will be a bald cypress that has no galls. The unfortunate thing about this tree is that it gets very tall, so it's not suitable for a small garden. Mm -hmm. You really have to have a large landscape. I would say you'd have to have probably in maybe two acres at the minimum, because they can get as tall as 70 or 80 feet. But they're beautiful. They're beautiful oh, trees. They're really nice. I want to show them the oh, yeah. show, show them the cones so that they don't confuse the galls with the cones. Very That's good. a good idea. Very good, Chuck. <coughs> I forgot to mention. This is the uh, seeds uh, of, of the bald cypress. So this is not the gall. <laughs> it's just really attractive. It's a very it's attractive looking. Usually much bigger than the gall, but not oh, yeah. always. Oh, yeah. Much larger than the gall. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Well, let's go to the Did You Know section right now. In 1600s Holland, tulips were once so valuable their bulbs were worth more than gold. This craze caused the Dutch economy to crash. I read Tulip Noir when I was in high school French class, all about how tulips were so important. Well, speaking of something important, let's talk about the P. Allen Smith trip that's coming up this October. And I'm glad that we've got Chuck Voigt right here at the table because he will be hosting along with uh, WILL's Heather Miller. And it's gonna be a great time. Uh, it's just a gorgeous garden. It's really uh, an interesting trip. So if you are interested, you can call that number and enjoy yourself. We had a great time last year. Right, and, and we're gonna go to a winery in, in Missouri uh, I think we're going to have dinner in, in the Branson area, go to P. Allen Smith's, and then hit the Memphis Botanic Garden on the way back. So, Which will be a treat. So it's, it's, it's not just P. Allen Smith, although that's probably worth a trip in, its, in itself. Yes, but those things combined, that's going to be a great trip. So sign up. There's a few spots left. It's Last I knew, there were a few. Yeah, so don't hesitate. Okay, let's <coughs> go to our callers next. And Rebecca has a question about zucchini on line two. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, how are you, Diane? Great, doing good. Okay, my zucchini plant is giving flowers, but then they fall off and I get no zucchini growing. Okay, I'm glad that you're here, Chuck. Are we going to well, give it to you, <laughs> the question? <coughs> Do you know the difference between male and female blossoms, first of all? 
ok the plant will typically start out making male blossoms which kind of attract the pollinators that we just talked about on the balcony garden and then a little bit later once that contact is established they'll start putting on female flowers which have what looks like a little tiny zucchini behind them the males just have kind of a narrow stalk in the flower the females have a zucchini and uh, and and the flower um, so if you look at them and they just have a, a slender stalk their male flowers hopefully as the plant keeps going uh, gets plenty of sunlight and all the all the things zucchini enjoy uh, female blossoms will will occur they typically produce a lot more male blossoms than female female blossoms uh, to the point where we sometimes recommend that you eat a few of them just for the heck of it. Um, you know, if, if the plant looks healthy, uh, I would say wait a little while and, and, and see if, if the female blossoms don't start to show up. Uh, I transplanted mine rather late, and uh, I noticed last weekend that they really started growing, and, and in those I actually saw a, a, a female blossom already on a small plant, so uh, I'm not... 100% sure of what I'm saying, but um, they should be coming soon. Then, for her. if they don't come out, come soon, then uh, uh, let us know, and and we'll try to come up with something else. But if the plant looks healthy, if it's getting plenty of sunshine, um, there's no real reason it shouldn't make female blossoms and, and zucchinis. It's it's usually the other way; they mm -hmm. they go crazy. That's so. right. Well. Would the excessive heat that we had have any effect either on the insects that might pollinate them or the blossoms like it does on a tomato or a pepper yeah it, it might but I don't know that we've been into you know we haven't been above 95 that much to this point have we I, I don't recall that we well, have it swings right yeah yeah up and, I, up and down I, I, I don't think so but um, you know. okay all righty well hopefully that will clear up itself that's what we're hoping let's go to Wilma's question about Japanese beetles next on line three Hi, Wilma. Hello. Uh, I enjoyed the program very much. Thank you. And uh, so I thought I needed to call in. I have a daughter that has an infestation of these uh, Japanese beetles. And mm -hmm. on she's planted a bunch of uh, fruit trees, and then her roses are just absolutely filled with them. Is there anything that they're doing with about this now, about the beetles? Can I, I want to I want to talk to the rose sure. and then we'll turn it over to you. I know a nurseryman who just removes, I know this is sad, but just removes the rose flowers when, if it's a heavy infestation. Now, that may be a really sad thing to do, but it really clears up that part. Now, I had to get that in. So anyway, Jim, but next to you. Of course, they do feed on the foliage as well. Yes, they do. <laughs> but, but they're they more like, attractive to the flower. They're, they're attracted, attracted to the flower yeah. before they go to the foliage. Well, it's a real problem. I mean, the cultural method, the <laughs> non-insecticide method, would be go out with a, uh, a pan of soapy water. And uh, generally, I do that after sunrise. But you don't want to do it too late in the, in the day because if you get near the plants that infested, they see you and they fly off. So do it early, uh, about mid-morning, when it's a little cooler, and then shake the uh, infested plant or plant part over this soapy water, and they'll fall in there and they'll drown. That's, that's the non-chemical control. The other uh, chemical control is Ortho makes a, a material called Ortho Bug and Be Gone spray that uh, contains permethrin. And so, and another company that uh, makes pyrethrins is Bonide, B-O-N-I-D-E. So I think if you look at the products, either by Bonide or Ortho for Japanese beetle control, then you can spray for the adults. But it's a real problem. I don't know, in my area, uh, central Illinois, there's no more of a problem. I mean, we have a few, but nothing like we had several years ago. But it's worse this year than it's been for the last several years because of the mild winter that we had. Well, mild winter, but also we had it, we had uh, sufficient moisture late in the summer into the fall, where previously we had very dry times in that time, and they need a certain amount of was eleven inches of rain or something during that development period, or they don't they don't survive. And in I, the in the soil in the soil in right. The soil, and yeah. and we uh, we were kind of lulled into a sense of false security because. This year, for the first time, I've seen all that brown lacy foliage on 
on crab apples and, and mm -hmm. going linden after trees. grapes and oh. linden trees. Mm -hmm. it, it, yes, I have After, year. I, I really? think, at least three years wow. when, when they, it seemed like, well... But not as many as the peak. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, it's not like when you're, peak. like, yeah. when you're on the crest of that wave as they're right. heading further out. Yeah. But yeah. this I, is the worst year we've had in at least mm. I'd four. Say three. Yeah. And the pyrethrums, now that's actually a... A, a safe product. Yes, it is a very safe. It's from um, the pyrethrum daisy chrysanthemum right. yeah. root. Now, so whatever, whatever they're calling them these days. Well, it's made commercially. It has multiple now. common names. It's, yeah. it's not actually made by the leaves anymore. The flower but blooms, that's where but it, but it originated. It from, came uh, from actually from Africa. So, yeah, but it is a is a very safe biological control. biological control. Okay, well, I knew we'd get some Japanese beetle questions, so I'm glad to have that one taken care of. Let's go to Carol's uh, question about green beans next, and this is on line four. Hi, Carol. Hi. Um, my question involves, we have beautiful green beans, very lush, with lots of bloom, but no beans. This is a phenomenon that seems to be occurring in our area, and I wondered what is causing this, and how do I prevent it next year? So there were a lot of, of flowers, but no beans. I think beans are more likely to react to the okay, kind of hot weather we we've go. had than, than uh, what we were talking about before. So I think as we get into some of, you know, we seem to be up and down and up and down. Um, hopefully the down will be long enough that you'll get some, some beans pollinated that get attached and and, and go ahead and develop. Um, could also be fertility. I don't know what your fertility program is. Uh, if you over fertilize beans with things like nitrogen, sometimes uh, they get a little rambunctious in how much leaf they put on. And, but generally, it, you know, if, if, if the weather is even moderate, uh, it's hard to keep a green bean plant from setting green beans. So mm -hmm. I, would, I would think it probably is gonna be a self-correcting problem uh, as we go through the rest of the season, um, and again, if, if that's it, my favorite phrase: self-correcting okay. problem. That's it's it, hope so. It sounds yeah, like yeah, it, it will it, be. It, it, yeah, it should be a, a specific set of environmental conditions that are causing it, and if those go away, then it should be okay. Because mine have just started going crazy yes. just recently, yes, which is behind a few people, but. Yeah, I got Because they got seated late, late <laughs> so yeah. that takes care of that. Yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> yes, it will. <coughs> okay, well, let's go to Mark's question about the lawn on line five. Hi, Mark. Hi. Hey, good evening, and thanks for taking my call. You are uh, welcome. Hey, we had just had a driveway put in. On each side of the driveway, there's about a two-foot area by about 40-foot long that's fresh-turned dirt. And from what I understand, the best time to feed is in the fall, However, we would like to uh, go ahead and get some seed planted so it's not an eyesore for the next two or three months. And I want to know the best, you know, the best way to possibly get some grass sown in there, uh, you know, whether I should put some fresh topsoil in, whether you cover it with straw, uh, you know, watering so you don't, uh, you know, wash the grass out. Uh, but we'd like to try to do something before, before the fall hits. Okay, I'm looking at you, David. Well, I think with the lawn, um, getting grass established during the summertime, you're looking at a cool season grass, typically uh, perennial ryegrass, tall fescues, the Kentucky bluegrass, um, and they really don't like the heat that we have. They will germinate very quickly, but it does put a lot of stress on them. If there was any grass I would seed right now, I would probably go with more with the perennial ryegrass. It's going to come up quickest. If it's in full sun, it will probably have the less disease susceptibility. But I'm also thinking maybe coming back even right uh, between Memorial Day and a couple weeks, uh, not Memorial Day, Labor Day, mm -hmm. uh, clear back in September, and then maybe a couple weeks and then overseeding it. Can't stress enough that there needs to be good quality soil, put compost in. If you have access to topsoil, yes, till that in maybe to six inches deep. Any type of seed that you put down is gonna to need to be kept moist as it's germinating. And so that may mean that you're gonna be watering uh, maybe two or three times a day, but not a lot. I mean, you're gonna turn that sprinkler on for maybe five, 10 minutes, just wet where that seed is, which is gonna be slightly buried. 
the straw will help keep that moisture in, but if it's next to a driveway and next to a, a, a street, you're gonna get that heat reflection and that straw may not be that uh, beneficial. It may also start adding thatch, but thatch also can be beneficial too. It's just too much thatch that's bad. Realize that also if you seed at this time of the year, you've got a good chance that every weed seed that's in that area is gonna come up too. So you may have more weeds that are gonna germinate. Uh, if possible, go ahead, do it. You're gonna to have to get out there and, and pull the weeds out. But I'm thinking if you can wait till September, you'd be a lot better off. I know it's easier said than done. If you can, and then there's sod. Sod, sod, exactly. sod, definitely. Go ahead and put it's, sod it's, in. It's when it, with a smallish area like that, it wouldn't be horribly expensive, and I think it would be easier to mm. uh, keep sod alive because it's, oh. gonna, it's kind of self-melching. Absolutely. And and if there's any erosion potential, the sod itself would would hold the He's soil. He's probably still going to have to water at least once or twice a day until right. that sod gets established right. too. Right. Because if it dries out, it's going to bake and just oh, and it's just going to shrink and all of that. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Did you say watering? Let's go to a show and tell. Have you oh, got something? I uh, just got, I have <laughs> lots of sprinklers. I mean, uh, and this the whole wet. point, that, well, I use that one. Uh, in fact, sometimes I use all of these. Um, lots of different types of sprinklers out on the market. I think the biggest thing to remember about sprinklers is that you need to water sufficiently that you are wetting the ground down six to eight to 10 inches. And a lot of times people think, oh, I'm just going to turn the sprinkler on for 10, 15, 20 minutes after I mow. And they don't realize that on the typical sprinkler that goes back and forth like this, it goes like that. You may need to leave it on anywhere from 60 to 90 to 120 minutes. Get a little cat food uh, can or a tuna fish can that's about an inch deep. Put it three quarters of the way out. Then uh, when it's filled, look at your watch. Say, hey, it took 90 minutes to do that. Every time, if you're going to water an inch, it's going to be 90 minutes. But lots of different sprinklers, and the good old-fashioned ones still work, uh, and they're very well made. I mean, cast iron, uh, I think this is bronze or brass, and this one's copper. Yes, we were kind of... And plastic. This is the one we used to run through when oh, we yeah. were kids. Oh, it, yeah. It, it makes <coughs> a great fountain when you, you turn them on. Uh, It'd be tricky for a 2 foot by 40 foot. That'd be yeah, tricky, that, so... Yeah, you know, and I'm almost thinking... I don't know, drip That's irrigation what I was, hose I was might be something it. good. And they have some flat ones that actually shoot out little arches, and so maybe the flat ones might be a little bit better than the regular plain drip irrigation hose. That's exactly the one I have with a just gravity feed um, yeah. rainwater oh, catchment. Oh, like a rain barrel yeah. type mm -hmm. of, yeah. Something that's very linear like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And it just Absolutely. goes along the row that I planted. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, yes. well, good. It was a good segue. I thought we might as, well, might as well chat about watering while we're on the case. Well, we have a tomato hookworm question, and I would like to go to that one since uh, Dr. Appleby is here. So let's go to Jean's question on line three. Hi, Jean. Hi. I've noticed large green caterpillars on my tomatoes and my peppers. I wonder if when I pull that fruit off of those vines, can I put that in the compost, or do I need to destroy it differently? You, you mean just the fruit itself? Yes, like the peppers and the tomatoes. Oh, I, there's no problem there. I, I, are you talking about the tomato hornworm, the large oh, uh, yes. green? Okay, so. Yeah, that's called hornworm. a tomato hornworm. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, you can do that. Uh, sometimes that fruit will ripen up, even though it's been damaged and fed upon. So. Um, I think I'd just leave it on the uh, on the on the plant. Yeah, pick the <laughs> pick the larvae, not the not the not the tomatoes. Yeah, but I would start scouting for those. Right. The minute you find it's like one, it's kind of early in the day when they're a little bit sluggish, because they're 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 very well camouflaged and not necessarily real easy to find. Uh, if you look on the ground where there's fresh uh, caterpillar poo. Uh, you can kind of look up above and sometimes find them because uh, it, it, it isn't fresh for a long time. Uh, but but they, it's amazing how something that big and nasty looking can hide as easily as it does. But uh, just pick them off 
and then always if you see the little white little white uh, cocoons on their backs that that's a parasitic wasp that we want to encourage so let the wasp go ahead and kill it and, and then it can infect others as it gets about its business yeah. so it's really just eating the leaves it's not well, oh, they, yeah, they, yeah. they get into the fruit if they, they actually. But you usually, if you find yeah. them early, they're, yes, they're yeah. really yes. just eating. Yes, they the start leaves. on the yeah. leaves and, and so pay go attention from there. so it doesn't get to the fruit. But, but yes, if you've seen them, it sounds like a fairly fairly uh, big infestation if they're on peppers too, because usually they'll. Yeah, I've not they'll, seen they'll, them on peppers. They'll go to tomatoes preferentially. Okay, well, thank you everyone <coughs> for great questions and for your answers. I appreciate it. We hope that you have another good week out in the garden. See you next time. Bye-bye.